you start growing your garden, preparing to do so, you've got to make sure that you choose the proper location. Get it in the sunlight. Do not expect to grow a successful garden in the shade. You want to make sure you've got water close by. You remember Kenneth from Africa? He hauled two five-gallon buckets of water half a mile from the river multiple times every day to grow that garden. That's how valuable water is. And uh, we've got to make sure we've got water close to our garden. Level your ground, at least the area in which the actual plants are growing. The aisles don't have to be level, but the beds do. And we'll show you more about that. Clean the ground. You want to remove everything, including weeds, rocks, anything and everything that might be there. You want to outline the perimeter. Stick it out so you know what you're dealing with. That way you can build a garden that you know what you've got. You want a fence to protect against intruders. So, you're going to... Yes, ma'am. Definitely want to remove the lawn. Yeah. Yeah, yeah by all means, I would get something and, and take that... Uh, what do you call it? The sod. Take the sod away, yeah. As a matter of fact, I would do it more than just where the bed is. I would give yourself bare aisles and a bare perimeter because the grass will come back in and invade your garden very quickly because of the nutrition that it will find there. So remove the lawn from the entire garden. Don't end up with, with grassy walkways or end up with grass in your boxes. So, yes ma'am. You want to have the plants be able to get to the soil. So the plastic keeps them from doing that. It also inhibits the drainage. So you can end up killing your plants because they haven't been able to drain properly. Yeah, so the plastic is not a great idea. Yes, ma'am? When you say plants, do you mean directly around the garden or just the yard you have? I couldn't hear the question. Say it again. Do you mean that there needs to be a fence directly around the garden or can it just be the yard? What you want to do is protect your garden from the critters. Depends on the critters. If you've got a dog or a cat that's going to be digging in your garden, your fence might be different than if you've got deer. The fence might be different if you've got gophers, because in case of the gopher, you may very well want to put hardware cloth underneath that garden so they can't come up and get your stuff. Yeah. All of the changes that we saw there, you remember he was growing on the ridges, 30 inch centers in Papua New Guinea. He changed eight or five foot wide beds, solid crops in Trinidad and a few other places. Um, in um, Okinawa, he was narrow beds, 18 inch wide boxes. All of these changes were the baker in him doing the very best he knew how, experimenting with improvements, making changes only when improvements were documented to be substantial. And he built books all of this time. And each book measured what he was doing at that time, the very best information that he knew. And even his earliest book, 1975, More Food from Your Garden, still is loved and used today. But, the latest one is even better, and that's the, the gardening course book. So that's the kind of thing that he did. Even his earliest ones are great, the people love them. And some of them are ideal because they have pictures, and those of us who love pictures, his books were written in such a way that uh, he'd have a small picture and then a description. Picture, description, picture, description, almost like a slideshow. And so they're very, very instructive, how-to kind of books. 18-inch beds. You tie strings to the stakes. Uh, I hope to be able to show you some more about this detail in the dirt. By the way, how many are growing in the dirt? And then the rest of you are growing in containers? So we've got a lot of folks with small yards that want to grow in containers. That's great. You'll actually see containers at the garden today, and we'll talk to you more about the dirt uh, as we go along here. 
you will till the aisles a couple of inches deep and then pull soil from the aisle into the bed area so that the bed itself ends up being a couple of inches higher than the aisle. You want to make sure that planting area is level so you don't waste the water and the nutrition. We talk about nutrition at some length today and I hope that I'll be able to convince you that what we've got is the perfect plant food for your garden, for everything in your yard. David will show you examples of his yard and what it's done for his trees and shrubs and berries and so forth. Once you've got those beds made, you only have to dig and care for the actual growing area. It ends up being about 17% of your garden. So once you've got this done, then it becomes a piece of cake. Re-level the beds once you've got the nutrition in them. Build the four inch ridges to hold the water and you plant. Another of the documents that you've got is called the Garden Planting Details Schedule. Can we have everyone look at that for a minute? So many times people receive information about how to plant things and the distances are maybe a lot further apart than they need to be. Sometimes they're a lot closer than they should be. We plant according to the plant size at maturity so that we make maximum use of the space, the water, the light, the fertilizer. And that schedule there for basically every plant in your garden will give you 14 items of information including when to plant, where to plant, whether or not to plant seeds or seedlings, how deep to plant, did I say how far apart to plant? It'll tell you uh, how long it will take your, your plants to produce a crop, how tall they will get, how much to expect, all of these things that you need. That should be in your possession at all times when you're working in your garden, seriously. It's actually a, uh, an appendix in the gardening course book, if I were you, I'd also put that in plastic, because that is, that's great information, it really is. This, to me, is far, far better and more accurate than what you'll find on seed packets. We use a marker for accurate spacing of our plants. You'll see that marker in the garden today. And we'll show you a picture of it in a few minutes. If you're interested in extending your growing season, for goodness sake, consider growing your own seedlings because that by itself will increase your garden yield substantially. Give you a month to six weeks more productive gardening. We apply a little bit of N. Anybody know what that is? The most common and ubiquitous substance in our earth. 76% of the Earth's atmosphere is nitrogen. Plants need it, it's the number one nutrient for plants. I will show you a little bit more about that. If you're planting seeds, cover them with sand. Do not cover them with your clay soil. This is another key thing that will greatly increase your plant's germination and the percentage that you'll get above ground. I'll show you how to do that in the garden. If you've got clay soil, you don't have to pay a lot of money to bring in sand or whatever to amend that clay soil. Just sprinkle some sand in the cracks as they develop. Water that in and the cracks will disappear and you'll be just fine. By the way, Thanksgiving point, how many have seen or been to Thanksgiving point? A man by the name of Kay Fox sold 500 acres to Alan Ashton and then he began working there at Thanksgiving Point. And he helped Jacob with the gardens that, that Jacob created. I was there in 1998. One day, Kay Fox said to me, if I had known back when I sold my property what I know today about the net lighter system of growing, I would have never sold my farm. Because it changed so dramatically what he was able to do on that hard, miserable clay soil that he had been earning a subsistence living on his whole life. So that's
that's what he says about it. Go over it. You saw the picture of my tomatoes at the zoo garden. This is uh, a way to increase your yields anywhere from three to five times in the same amount of space, just by growing vertically. So you, by all means, want to be doing that. Water properly. Don't sprinkle. By the way, you'll hear some redundancy, some repetition today. This is intentional. We'll say it, we'll show you pictures, then we'll show it to you in the garden. Because as human beings, we need some repetition in order to really have things drilled into us, don't we? So please don't uh, get too bored or give up on me when I say kind of the same thing over again in a different way. Do it in the morning. That's the best time, but if your plants are hurting, don't wait. Water them as soon as you discover that they need it. You've got to keep the soil moist because a wilting plant is dying. Simply wrap a, ho a, a towel around your hose, clamp it to the hose, wrap it several times around, and then lay it in the bed, and the water will, full flow of water will come out without washing your plants away. Well, that's a way to water simply and easily and inexpensively. You only apply an inch of water. Basically, you put water down until you have standing water. That means that the ground has reached field capacity, or as much water as it can hold. And then we teach you and show you how to automate your watering, which makes it all easier, faster, saves water, and so much more enjoyable. Talking about food, very quickly, plants must have food to grow. And they need a balanced nutrition, just like you and I do. Most of the time we don't give them balanced nutrition. They receive it as water-soluble minerals through their roots. That's the way they get it. So we provide a combination, what we call a pre-plant, and that's the foundation of a good feeding program, and that's mostly calcium. Just like our bones, the structure of our bones and teeth is calcium, the basic structure of a plant is calcium. So you've got to have that. And uh, then a weekly feed which has the other ingredients. Don't have to write this down, but you may want to make a note of it mentally. We feed until three weeks before plant maturity. Not because feeding all the way up until maturity is going to hurt anything, just we don't want to waste the fertilizers. They've got enough by that time. That's for single crop varieties and for evergreen plants. We feed until eight weeks before we turn the crop out, like on frost. Here's how much we apply. One ounce of the pre plant per foot and a half ounce of weekly feed per foot. And one application goes down the center of that bed between two rows of plants. So, for example, 16 ounces, one pound of the weekly feed will feed 64 feet of plants. That's not very much. As a matter of fact, that represents about seven ounces of actual fertilizer salts in 32 feet, 64 feet of row. That give you an idea of how little is needed when you do it right. If you couldn't get this, and all you had was compost or manure, we recommend that you sterilize it because of the potential for disease, weed seeds, and bugs in the material. Okay, very quickly. Number six here is stop the competition. And you've got to eliminate weeds. You better get them when they're tiny. That's the best time. We use what we call a scuffle hoe, two-way hoe, stir hoe, hula hoes. Comes by many names. We'll actually have some of those to show you in the garden today. Great tool, and if you cut your weeds off as they first appear, it's easy. My half-acre garden at Hobel Zoo, people were amazed that there weren't any weeds. 
And I'd say, how in the world do you do that? Roundup? And I'd say, E and O weeding. Got this new thing called E and O weeding. Really? Where do I get it? They were looking for something to bottle. And I said, early and often. And that's the, that's the secret. Early and often. <laughs> so, we don't like pesticides or herbicides. Oh, those chemicals, exactly, yeah. Do you know what? In some places, I have had to use them. Because when there is not a frost cycle to kill them, they just go crazy. Places like Papua New Guinea and Colombia and so forth. So sometimes they have to be used, but you always want to use the safest, uh, best thing you can. What we have found over the years is that our cultural practices, the way we grow, those empty, bare aisles that I talked about, those things keep us from having anywhere near as much problem with bugs and diseases as the typical garden. So those are our first lines of defense, is growing fast, growing healthy. You know, a healthy human being has a lot of disease resistance, don't we? It's those that are already compromised that end up getting sick and dying. And that's what we find in the garden, same thing. So, very quickly, remove the residue and prepare it for the next garden. Don't let the plants stay in the garden, and when they're harvested, get rid of the materials. If it's clean, you can plow it back into the ground. That's the best place for it to compost. If it's compromised at all with bugs or diseases, remove it as far away from the garden as possible. Folks, I'll be pouring information onto you so fast and so hard today that you'll need uh, track shoes to keep up. And if the time comes when you want to share it with others, help others, we got someone filming it here. I don't know if she's going to be sharing it, but we have created a gardening seminar CD DVD that has <clears throat> 10 to 12 hours of material on it that you can use for yourself or to help and teach others. Also. As I said, I've digitized all of his books and materials. It's in something called the Midlander Gardening Library CD. Searchable PDF files, usable on any platform. Great material for the agriculture training. Those are his books. We won't take time. I'll show them to you in the garden. By the way, the reason I'm not showing you books here is because the church is a charitable organization and donations to the church are tax deductible. And the IRS and the government would love to be able to deny the church that tax exempt status. And one thing that could cause that is if they determined that the church was conducting business, commercial enterprises on church property. Verbal, no, no. So we do none of that on, on church property. I'm a charitable organization, so we don't conduct um, commercial enterprises anyway, because uh, we don't take a salary, we don't make a profit, per se. But uh, we just don't want to, uh, we want to avoid the appearance of evil. So, there's also a 70 CD set, two, two CD set of 70 videos that are used in the training. So for the few of you here who really want a college level agronomy education, some of those things will be of interest. How many of you are concerned about the seeds? Being able to get seeds for your storage, being able to use those seeds in the future. We have some cans of uh, non-GMO heirloom garden seeds that are great. I consider them 23 varieties to be the best that we can find anywhere in the country. And that can includes over, over 30,000 seeds, several hundred dollars worth of seeds. That's available for a tiny fraction of that in the garden. So that's what your garden could look like. This garden is Pompeon uh, Colombia. The woman is a sister of a famous doctor who believed, like Jacob believed, that the problems in the world are because of bad nutrition. And he spent uh, the last 10 or 15 years lecturing around the world about that. He wasn't able to replicate a good garden in his own yard. And he finally heard about the Midlighter system. He went to his church, happened to be the LDS church. He's a 
district president there, and he said, please send someone down here who will teach us the Midliner system of growing. And so, church sent us there on a mission, and we did just that. Taught at the university, and gave him the best garden he had ever seen. And uh, of course, the university had never seen anything like that either. You've seen that picture? That's what it can be like in that one. So how can you help? We just encourage you to grow a good garden and then pay it forward. Make sure that others understand this. I'm trying to pay it forward. I believe it's important and I feel a great responsibility and privilege to do it. As a matter of fact, we just bought a school in the name of the foundation. The school is halfway between Adam on the Island and Far West, Missouri. And we will be turning it into a year-round growing situation. We've got year-round greenhouses going on this year. So any time of the year, if you're sick and tired of winter, come back to Missouri and uh, we'll have a growing over there in the middle of December, January. And I'm going to show you some pictures of, of that uh, year-round greenhouse. Okay, let's just a little more in depth now about we've talked about the six steps of growing. Let's turn this into the six laws of plant growth specifically. First law of plant growth. We're going to be introducing you to what I call the poor man's hydroponic method of growing. And why would I call it that? Because hydroponic growers do it best. They can, on one acre, grow 330 tons of tomatoes. 660,000 pounds of tomatoes on one acre. That's pretty phenomenal, isn't it? Of course, they have a million dollars an acre invested in their buildings and equipment. So that makes it a little out of our reach. We approach those yields with a tiny fraction of that kind of investment. I'll give you, put things in perspective. A tractor farmer will produce 30 to 35 tons an acre, one tenth of what a hydroponic grower can do. A typical backyard gardener might produce 10 tons an acre if they were to extrapolate their little garden out to the size of an acre. We can produce 100 tons plus per acre by growing vertically, by feeding our plants by borrowing some of those principles of the hydroponic grower and adapting them to the backyard garden. That's what we've done. As a matter of fact, the Benson Institute for many years went around the world trying to help people become self-sufficient in their food production and all they taught that you had to have was a hectare of ground. And we know how much a hectare is? Two and a half acres. Not very many people have got two and a half acres, do they? But that is what the Benson Institute model requires for self-sufficiency. Jacob Mintleiter teaches, and I demonstrate, that a family of four can live out of one twentieth of an acre. And we'll show you how. So, poor man's hydroponic method. How about the best of organic? Does that sound like an oxymoron? Like opposite ends of the spectrum? In some ways it is, but we fit the bill on both counts. And I'll show you why and how. It said that you can have a great garden in any soil. Just remember these laws of plant growth. Light is number one. A plant, 95% of the plant is the result of photosynthesis. A plant does that by use of sunlight and three elements, carbon, oxygen, hydrogen. Carbohydrates. That's where that word came from, and that's what the plant uses. So in order to do that, it's got to have full sunlight all day long, doesn't it? In order to do it most effectively. Well, take a look, if you will, at this picture. This is my garden at Hobo Zoo one year. And I planted tomatoes to the east, and corn to the west, and sweet peppers in the middle. 10.30 in the morning, what's happening? My peppers are just now starting to get sunlight, aren't they? 
to that sunlight. By 2.33 in the afternoon, they're in the shade again. Was I getting any production on my peppers? Not really. Not until the 1st of August when I took down the corn after it had produced. So, you've got to make sure that your plants have sunlight and they will avoid shade, whether it comes from a building, a wall, a tree, other plants. All you've got to do is make sure that your tall plants are north or east of short plants. Doesn't matter the direction of your rows, just make sure tall plants are not shading short plants. The other thing is that many times a plant will shade itself more than it's healthy for the plant. And so we will prune, that's called a sucker stem. We'll prune the sucker stems, we'll prune some of the leaves so that the plant gets adequate light into the center and so that it can do its job best and produce the most fruit. Yes, sir? He asks, how you secure the plant to the string? Uh, most of them, you just gently guide the string around the stem, and the, the stem is strong enough to hold the plant up when it has that string. Now, it's not string string, it's baby twine that we use. And we'll have some of it in the garden, and we strongly recommend you use nothing but 170-pound polypropylene baby twine. It's the only thing strong enough only thing that will last for many years to guarantee that it will hold your plants up. Because we'll have 20, 30, 40 pounds of fruit on one vine hanging on that string. Sorry. Set them off that growth temperature. Seeds are the most critical because they have to have a temperature in a very narrow range in order to germinate. And the ideal range is from 70 to 85 degrees. So you want the soil temperature, not necessarily the air temperature, but the soil to be in that range, 70 to 85 degrees. If you have to get a heat mat, it doesn't cost much, plug that in and that will keep your soil temperature uniform and you'll have very fast germination. Other ways that you can control the temperature to protect your plants. You see here, this is Jacob Midlider's backyard, and we'll see more of it. But in the back there, he had what he called A frame type greenhouses, and he'll cover those. And then he has down below essentially a greenhouse within a greenhouse. And out here, same idea, except he was using wire. He determined wire was not very good because it would get rusty and then the movement from the wind would tear the plastic. So much prefer that kind, which is PVC pipe. And we'll show you how to do that. If you want to plant this time of the year and there's still got cold weather, all you do is put these things down and then you cover them. See the sides there are buried in dirt the temperature must be above 55 degrees this day because the ends are open. What you'll find is when the temperature is above 70 degrees, we take them off. And put them back on again when the, when the temperature goes down. Got to avoid the frost, don't you? Most of your plants will not handle any frost. Some of them can handle a little bit. By the way, the schedule of the current planting detail schedule, I'll show you that. Four different kinds of plants, hardy, semi-hardy, frost sensitive, and frost intolerant. So based on that measurement, then it'll tell you when to plant. All you need to know is your average day of last frost. Does anyone know what that day is here? Mother's Day changes year to year, but probably Yes, ma'am. May 8th. May 8th is what she says, okay. Check that out. Uh, if that's the day, then that's great. You might have a frost later than that, but on average, that's going to be the last day. And so based on your schedule there, if it's hardy, you can plant as much as four weeks before that date. If it's frost intolerant, you have to wait till two weeks after that date. 
no matter what kind of plant it is, this can help you plant earlier because that will protect your plants. And, uh, David at LDS Prepper has videos that show that he grew right through the winter by protecting his plants. You may not be able to do quite that here, but without a greenhouse like this, what you see here is my greenhouse of my home in Gallatin, Missouri. I had the greenhouse, and then I discovered something that just got me so excited. Something called geothermal using air. Of course, geo is the earth, thermal is heat, so earth heat using air. And all I did was take a ditch witch and trench, six trenches, one at a time, put a four inch corrugated solid drain pipe. Three times, back and forth. Coming up on the opposite end and coming down on this end, and they all come together into a manifold with a simple blower. And all we do is blow air through that. Talk about protecting your plants. We had as cold as 17 degrees below zero with a minus 34 wind chill factor. That was in place, just like that. The temperature in that greenhouse was 36 degrees plus. I then, being fearful that I would freeze my plants if things got terrible, I put a little propane heater in. That day it was five degrees above zero and minus five something uh, windshield factor. The temperature in the greenhouse was 40 degrees. I turned the uh, propane heater on to the lowest setting and in 10 minutes the temperature was 60 degrees and it's never been below 55 in my greenhouse since then. That is doable for you. This greenhouse, I'll show you some pictures if we get a minute, this greenhouse feeds a dozen families all the greens that they can eat. I've got 11 citrus trees in that greenhouse right now with fruit on them. Is that fun in the middle of the winter? That is protecting the temperature. Not that expensive. Yes, ma'am. It's called black corrugated drain pipe at four inch. It's solid rather than the slotted. Yes, sir. I started at about five and a half feet deep. And we would have them going like this so that the top of them was about three and a half feet deep. Uh, you can email me and I can send you more information about that if you're interested, but believe me, three or four of those in a neighborhood can make a world of difference for the health of your people. How about peppers and tomatoes, beans and things year-round? Now, the protection against the heat is equally important. In my greenhouse, I'm blowing 55 degree air in the summer so that it doesn't get as hot as it would otherwise. Here, this is your Trinidad. These T-frames have arch PVC and plastic over them to protect against driving rain and the equatorial sun that's coming down on them. So, doesn't matter. Want that narrow temperature range. If it's too high, maybe shade cloth. Phoenix and Texas, they put shade cloth up in the summer. And then they put plastic down in the winter and they grow year round. Third law of plant growth, air. Remember carbon, oxygen, hydrogen, they get it from the air. And they gotta get it through their roots. So if you've got standing water, you can end up flooding and killing your plants. All we had to do is put a French drain in that, and that became a beautiful and productive garden. Well, it's kind of like Spanish, but fancier. <laughs> we talked about this drain pipe. Uh, French drain uses the uh, solid hard pipe, typically, with a bunch of holes in it. And you just dig a trench, a foot or so deep, and put that pipe in it, and then put gravel. And so the water will drain to the low part of the place and take the water off. So 
platform be usable. <clears throat> this is how we build our beds. The planting area is about two inches higher than the aisle. We do not plant on the ridges. The purpose of planting on the ridges is to keep the plants from getting flooded. We don't have to worry about that because the soil there is above the, the level of the aisle. And so all we're watering is 10 to 12 inches right there. The entire rest of the garden is dry all the time. So weeds don't grow. You don't waste the water. Costs very little, even though we water almost every day. We use less than half the water of traditional watering. <clears throat> Speaking of water, we automate whenever we can. If you have to, you can use a hose like I described. The water itself doesn't have to be drinkable, but it must not be toxic. I understand that a plant is a continuous water pipe, more than 80 percent water, and from the tip of the highest leaf to the bottom of the lowest root in the ground, that plant is a water pipe, and it has to have moisture all the time available to it. If you water once in eight days, what happens to that plant? During the seven of those eight days, it is sending its roots down, 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 following the water table so that it has moisture. Jacob said, we don't want to have a plant waste its energy following the water table. We want it to produce fruit. So we provide the water on a daily basis as needed. And still we're able to do it using less water than the traditional methods because of what he did there. I have a question. Yes, ma'am. About the aisles and like the water in the air. Uh -huh. Is there are you supposed to leave the aisles like the dirt, the soil, or can you put like gravel down or like a weed barrier or something in the aisles? We have discovered through much experimentation and much sad experience that bare dirt is the best. Always. What about Always. for grow boxes? Bare dirt in the aisles, whether it's boxes or beds, doesn't matter. Bare dirt is the best. You weed easier, you don't have to fight with the gravel. See, gravel and other things become havens for bugs and diseases. And if they find any place to hide that's cool and damp and dark, they love it. We want to create the Sahara Desert for that bug to walk across and to get to lunch. And that's one of the cultural practices of this system of growing that makes our plants less susceptible to problems, bugs and diseases. It truly is. Yes, sir? Will a plant consume more water than it needs? No, typically it will not. Uh, sometimes a plant, if it is starved for water, uh, will bring a lot of water in. The thing that makes it appear that it's bringing more than it needs is if the temperature is extreme. For example, uh, ripe tomato. While that tomato is green, the skin is flexible and it's continuing to expand. But as soon as it starts to turn pink, it becomes rigid and it won't expand anymore. And so, if it gets uneven watering, especially if it's uneven watering, and so it gets a big watering, and then the heat hits that plant, the water expands and it breaks the skin. And so you get uh, your, your tomatoes cracking. That's not saying that the plant had more water than it needed. It's just that the uneven watering contributed and then the, temp the heat and the rigidity of the plant, uh, the, the fruit walls, not, uh, not allowing it to expand. Is that mine? Funny! <laughs> usually give that to my wife so that she can take care of it. Oh, thank you, dear. All right, we didn't have any more questions here. We'll keep moving along quickly. And we've got to get through here in just a few minutes. The level beds, you see, make it so the plant, or the water is not wasted. It just gently seeps, fills the bed, and once you've got standing water, there's your water. 
a uniform distribution of the water and the mineral nutrients, and we water only the, the roots on the plants. Don't sprinkle. That not only waters the weeds, but it wastes water and it promotes diseases. The rich beds, anyway, these uh, are, again, my garden at the Hobo Zoo. And that was a fellow who was helping me that year, and his adopted daughter. The ridges define them bit aesthetically, but they hold, of course, the water and the fertilizer. Automating the water is something that really should be considered if you're going to be a serious grower. It takes a little time, it takes a little money, but it is so nice. I've got commercial growers that have big gardens, and they water 25 seconds in a bed. That's all it takes. Now, yours may be different, depending on the materials you're using, the length of your bed, the pressure of your water, so we can't say exactly. In the boxes, all you do is water till the water starts to seep out the bottom, and you're done. But automating it is easier, faster, more efficient. And the plans are free on the website, they're in the book, they're so, so great, so easy to do. What about That's the, all it takes. Yes? What about below ground watering? You know, if you have the pipe buried underneath, is that... Um, we have found that there are problems with that that make it not worthwhile. Uh, you don't ever know exactly how much water your plants are getting. Um, sometimes the pipes can get plugged up if you get back pressure that will suck dirt into the pipes. Same thing holds true for... Um, what do you call it, soaker hoses and, uh, and those kind of things. So these the pipes are above ground, off the ground two or three inches, so they never have that problem. And the inexpensive PVC pipe costs like a dollar sixteen for ten feet. It's so inexpensive. And my zoo garden, I used them for twenty years. So they last almost forever. Yes, we make holes in PVC pipe. Mm -hmm. Yes, indeed. We use PVC pipe. We put holes in it. We'll show you the garden. And this is this is it right there. That's the instructions. That's how simple it is. Fifth law of plant growth: food. Here's another lady, the lady in the white coat, a student of ours in Armenia. After a three-month course, she was hired by another NGO or charitable organization to teach the farmers in the Republic of Georgia at 10 times the money she'd ever seen before. So we went over there for a couple of weeks to help support her in that project. The plants need 13 more elements over and above the three that they get from the air. The big three major elements, NPK. You see a bag that says 16, 16, 16? Nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium. Worldwide, the manufacturers of fertilizers must put the percentages of those big three on the back. So we always know what we're getting. Anyone use NPK in your gardens? I hope to see a few hands. There are the three called secondary elements that are as important, just not in as large quantities. I've mentioned calcium, sulfur, magnesium. These are also important for plants. And seven others, called micronutrients or trace elements. And these are also essential. Most people, even most growers, don't have much of any idea about the micronutrients or the trace elements. And you'd find it hard to get them if you were to go to the store. It's almost impossible to find those. That's why the foundation has made them available in a small package with instructions how to mix them with NPK 16, 16, 16 and get the perfect fertilizer for your garden. And here are the instructions. That picture you see is gypsum and then you've got Epsom salt, and 20-butene borax. And that becomes the pre-plant 
mix. That's that foundation of a good feeding program. Understand that plants receive these things as water-soluble minerals through their roots. That is so important to understand because there's no guesswork. We know exactly what the plants are getting. If, for example, you're using manure, how do the plants get that manure? Can plants take up manure? They can't. They cannot. It has to be reverted back from the organic state back to the water-soluble mineral state. And what does that? It's redworms, bugs, microbes, bacteria, so forth. And that's why the organic enthusiasts say that those things are so important. Because certainly if you're using manure, you've got to have it revert back from organic to mineral state. Understand this, folks. J.I. Rodale, the father of organic gardening, the publisher of Rodale's Organic Gardening magazine, said, and I quote, a plant cannot tell the difference between nitrogen from a bag and nitrogen from a leaf or manure. I think he said it. You can't tell the difference from, between nitrogen from a leaf and nitrogen from a fertilizer bag is the way he said it. Doesn't make any difference to the plant. As long as it's water-soluble minerals, it's the same chemical. You see? Yes, sir. What quantity does it come in that you're pulling back to the yard? What quantity does it come in? Uh, we suggest that you buy these things at your local stores. We don't, we don't even sell that stuff. So you get the Epsom salt at your pharmacy. You get the borax. Uh, from your big uh, grocery stores in the uh, detergent section, and you get the gypsum from. Okay, it's in the book. Uh, we'll show you in the garden. It's a ratio of 84 and 1. But uh, you don't need to write it down right now. Yes, sir. No, no, it is not. Uh, potting soil is something that is supposedly has some nutrition in it, but nobody knows how much or what kind. Uh, and it's the kind of thing that you're supposed to be able to plant seedlings in. Uh, the pre-plant mix is just the nutrients. It's not the soil. Understand the difference. In other words, th this is not soil here. This is just the nutrition that you put into the soil. And we can put that into any kind of soil or even sawdust and sand. And grow healthy plants. So, I'm sorry. How soon do you put a plant? Oh, how soon do you put a plant before planting? You can plant two minutes before planting. Yeah, and there's no. And his question was how soon before planting, and it's a good question because those using manure, if they're going to be a certified organic grower, they must apply the manure or compost 90 to 120 days before harvest. So, they want to plant enough before planting that it doesn't burn the new seedlings. And so typically, they will put it in a few weeks before so that the, the maximum amount of, of salinity dissipates and it doesn't burn the new seedlings. And then the plant starts to grow. That's a big problem because plants need it regularly, don't they? They don't want it all at once. They don't need it all at once. And the hazard is, that they'll get too much at the beginning. Let me tell you a little story. My garden at Utah's Hogel Zoo, I would be there growing, and people would hang over the wall from the giraffes, and they'd say, hey, you use the animal manures. You know, I got this great source of great manure, animals got healthy diets. And I'd say, no, I don't. I have something better called Midlighter Magic. One day a lady came and uh, hung over the wall and said, you got to try that. The Seattle Zoo sells it. They call it Zoodoo, and they make it a lot of money. That <laughs> got my attention. So I called the Seattle Zoo, and I asked them what they were doing. They said, they just took the herbivore manures, none of the meat-eating animals, but just the plant-eating animals, and they would take it out into the forest, and they'd dump it out there, and then they would windrow it for about a year, and then they would bring it in and dry it. And, bag and sell it as you do. Now, what's it do in Seattle almost every day? 
Yeah. And so what does rain do to the nutrients in manure and compost? Leaches it out, doesn't it? So, uh, man, I could do better than that. So I bought a compost tumbler, big barrel that sits on the stand with a crank, and I learned how to make great compost. The problem was, after three weeks of 140 degree temperature, this beautiful black sweet smelling compost amounted to a pile up like this. And I could maybe feed one fourth of one row. And I had 125 beds. So it wasn't very practical. So I go out and I buy a full size cement mixer. And now I've got 12 yards to work with. So the zookeepers all brought their stuff to me and I had to load that truck and I learned how to balance that load <clears throat> so that it would heat up to 140 degrees. I could hold that temperature there for over three weeks. It took it a week to cool down. Then I would bring it out, bag it, and sell it on the, on the uh, side of the street at the zoo gift shop and the nurseries around Salt Lake City. The um, TV station and the newspapers would interview me, and I became known as the zoo man. <laughs> well, if I had more than I could use, I'd take the truck down to my garden, back it up, and offload. And then I put about 200, 250 pounds of this wonderful, the world's best compost, really, into a bed, about 250 pounds in each bed, till it in and grow in it. And what I found over two growing seasons was I could grow a better garden more consistently for a fraction of the cost, time, hassle, smell, using a better magic, natural minerals than I could with the world's best compost. So I kind of figured it out. Which was better? Yes, ma'am. Are they in the, do you put this pretty stuff in the ditches or all over the garden? Okay. Yeah, the question is where do you put that stuff? And we'll show you. We only put it at the root zone of the plants, where the plants can get at it. We never put any of it in the aisle, only in the growing area. Yeah. So, very quickly. Manure doesn't, you don't know what's in it, do you? It's like, is it one, 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 or half, 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 or what? What percentage? So there's no guesswork. We know exactly what we're feeding the plants. We had a question over here quickly. I heard that some people use lime instead of the gypsum. The difference is that lime is calcium carbonate, and calcium carbonate raises soil pH. Gypsum will not raise soil pH. You've already got high pH here. You don't want it raised anymore. And so we choose to use gypsum so that we don't make our pH worse. Uh, gypsum, I think probably Walmart and Lowe's and certainly your nurseries, um, uh, IFA, speed reading, and so forth will have it. Yes? So, so uh, we all understand, what are you suggesting that would be the magic nutrient that that is, uh, is still going to be for? When am I suggesting what? Okay, okay. I think it's asking, when do you apply it to the soil? We will apply it immediately after, before planting. You could apply it two or three weeks before if it's more convenient. But we like to apply it both. We prepare the beds, apply the nutrients, and then plant. And it can be immediately before. It's not going to be so much. Remember what I said about my zoo garden? I would put about 250 pounds of manure in each compost, in each bed. That has about 10 to 15 pounds of salt. 250 pounds, even at 1% nitrogen, 1, 1, 1, so forth. We're talking about 5% salt. 5% of 250 pounds is 12 and a half pounds of salt. And um, fertilizers are salts. I apply 7 ounces of salts to that same 30 foot bed, less than a 20th almost 1 25th the amount of salts. So we don't put too much chemicals in the ground at one time. It's actually the manure grower, the compost guy that puts more than is needed at one time. Do you understand the difference there? They have to because of the danger of disease in compost. We apply seven ounces at one time and several times during the growing season, only five or six times for cabbage, 
10 or 12 times from tomatoes, that kind of thing. So even in the entire season, we typically don't put anywhere near as much salt in the soil as the manure growing. Got questions? Yes, ma'am. Because the carnivores, the meat eaters, sometimes will have a disease in them. There's risk for meat. Same thing about the animals and the cannibals, you see. Yes, ma'am. Shelf life is probably a thousand years. <laughs> After that, the elements are going to burn with fermented heat. <laughs> yes. Do you ever recommend using any like kitchen scraps, like I've heard about, like eggshells or banana peels in garden? I think it's probably a good idea to put those somewhere where they'll do some good. Uh, under the soil is the best place for them. If you are doing composting and you are not getting 140 degrees 24/7, you're not killing the bugs. You're not killing the diseases. You're not killing the weed seeds. And you are inviting rodents and other things into your garden, even diseases. So, if you want to do a compost pile, do it underground. Just find a spot in your yard that's not being used and till it in and let it compost naturally underground. Yeah. We've got to move along here. I am taking too much time. You understand why I say that this could be called the best of organic? Because the, the, the uh, certified organic grower, if he finds, after he has used his organic materials, that there's something wrong, he will find what is wrong, the, the deficiency, by soil test, and then he will use min minerals from the bag. And they do it all the time. They have to. Because when that manure is in there, a month or so before you plant, and then that's 90 days before harvest, a lot of the nutrition's gone. And before the plant ever gets mature, it's showing deficiencies. And so the certified again grower has to be able to use those minerals, and he does. Midlier said, the family gardener can't afford that, doesn't want to take the time, doesn't have the knowledge or skill to do all of that stuff. Let's feed the plants just what they need in tiny amounts and grow a great garden without all of that problem and hassle. So that's, that's what we do. And there's the weekly feed mix, again, 16, 16, 16, a bag of what we call micronutrients, and some more, and some salt. Simple, to see it in the garden. We've already talked about that experiment. That is the result. Quickly, the competition. Weeds, bugs, animals, diseases. If you don't get your weeds out, you're going to have problems forever. Early and often is the way to do it. The cultural practices I mentioned. Dry aisles. Keeping your leaves off the ground. Those things greatly diminish the problems that you're going to have with these things. And so, no mulch, no ground cover. Diseases, for goodness sake, grow your plants fast. Keep your leaves off the ground. That's why growing vertically is so great. And if you give them the Sahara Desert to walk across, before they can get to the plants, you just don't have those problems. If you prune your plants properly, you minimize the problems greatly. This gentleman is the one who grew in the, in the sand, but he didn't know how to prune his tomatoes that first year. And so they got to be a mess. And it was not as productive as it could have been. We might make sure that the leaves are not on the ground and prune those off. By the way, those leaves are healthy. You should be eating them. Take them off, put them in green smoothies and salads and soups. Many different ways to use them, and you will be healthier. The leaves of most of the plants, cabbage, broccoli, cauliflower, uh, Brussels sprouts, carrots, <laughs> how about turnip leaves, beet greens, what's that? No, don't eat tomato leaves. No. I've got an article that you can find uh, on, the, on the website in, in our gardening groups. By the way, we've got um, Facebook, 
slash groups slash midlife gardening is our Facebook group that's free. You're all welcome to join that. Also Yahoo groups, Midlife Method Gardening at Yahoo groups. And that will teach you all of these things. So folks, if you follow this recipe, you will have a great garden. Let's take a minute or two break. David will supervise that and then we'll come back, show you Midlife's garden, and then we'll get ourselves over to the garden. Wow, that's a lot of information, huh? You guys getting right as cram? Is that good? Yeah, give them a round of applause. That is amazing. Uh, we're going to take a five-minute break. The bathrooms are, there's a women's bathroom over here. There's